Yes, so uh, good morning. Uh, today is Thursday, the May 19th. It's nine o'clock, and I'm calling the Finance Committee to order for today. And um, pursuant to Chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021, extended by Chapter 22 of the Acts of 2022, this meeting is being conducted by a remote mean, mem means. Members of the public who wish to access the meeting may do so via Zoom or uh, by telephone. Um, no in-person attendance of members of the public is permitted, but every effort is being made to ensure that the public can adequately access the proceedings in real time by technological means. Uh, so, uh, I'm at this point um, just want to remind everybody that uh, I am having to leave the meeting actually by Zoom link partway through. I will continue participating in the meeting and will be signing on at some point by telephone. And the, my link later will be by telephone because of that. Um, I have asked uh, the vice chair of the committee, Kathy Shane, to uh, be the chair for today's meeting and um, therefore um, it would, I guess what I was going to do is just ask that uh, the agenda for today's meeting be put on the screen and uh, I'm turning it over to Kathy. So Kathy, thank you. So I, I think what I will start by doing, Andy, is what you usually do, is just to make sure everyone can, uh, we get a voice confirmation from everyone that we have a quorum and members of the committee can hear and be heard. So Andy is clearly a yes. Kathy's a yes. Lynn Griesmer? Yes. Bob Hegner? Yes. Bernie Kubiak? Yes. Matt Holloway is here. Hi, Matt. Hi, President. And Michelle Miller. Here. And I don't see Alicia. Bernie Kubiak, did I call you already? Yes. Yeah, you did. OK. So um, I confirmed everyone. And we do not yet have uh, Alicia Walker. I will note that she's here. And Lynn will call. Uh, Council to order if we get to a quorum of the council, but I don't think we have it yet. Correct, Lynn? We do not, but I want to make sure. Uh oh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, we do not, but we do have Anna Devin, Devlin Gothier, and I want to make sure she can hear us and we can hear her. Anna? Good morning. Good morning. All right. Sounds loud and clear. <laughs> So I have the agenda for the meet today's meeting is up on the screen. And what I'd like to do, since I've noticed that uh, I see that Guilford has already joined us, is reverse the order. We will, if there are any other overview of review the budget questions or discussion, we can come back to that. But I would like to go right into public works. And I believe Lynn wanted to make some opening remarks before we hear from Guilford. Lynn has was in charge of this section of the budget um, for today and sent questions in an advance and I believe Bob then sent her some so Lynn I'm going to ask you to start before we then turn to Guilford. So I want to start by thanking DPW for um, some very, very outstanding things we've seen in town. Uh, one is the um, terrific uh, Graf, uh, I'm sorry, Kendrick Park, uh, and all the work that was done to design that and do that, and the um, various other park things that we've seen done. The other thing I want to point out is you listen to uh, what Guilford's going to introduce us to and the questions is the comprehensiveness of DPW. And the, one of the things that often happens is people will say, well, how does our DPW compare to other DPWs? And the problem is you have to look at what's inside DPW and its many departments to be able to ever do a comparison. Because unlike 
some places, for instance, have a separate water department or they'll have a separate sewer department or something roads might not be under DPW. In our case, everything that's under DPW that could possibly be under DPW is under DPW. And so when we look at DPW, that's one thing. The other thing is, as you look at DPW in so many instances, it's things we either take for granted or we don't see. And so it's probably one of the least um, understood and maybe appreciated departments in terms of what they do to help our town run literally every day. So with that, Guilford. <laughs> you need wow, to thanks, a, thanks a lot. That was really nice. Um, I mean, a lot, a lot of these projects come about from a lot of different things. A lot of people have input into it. Um, but, but, you know, one of the things that makes things like Groff Park, or not Groff Park, but Kendrick Park work um, is, is the staff we have. Um, we have four, well, actually five people upstairs who are our engineering staff. And Kendrick Park was designed by one of them. Um, he took all the surveys and all the input from all the people in the, all the different committees. And Paul Dethier put it together and he built that park. And he oftentimes had designers designers block and was like, I don't know, I think she did this. And, you know, but basically we turned him loose and said, make yourself the park you want to have. And he took everybody's inputs and made a park out of it. And he, he drove that 100% and made that pretty much the way it is now. So it's good people that, that make this work. Um, as, as we get into some of Lynn's questions, um, we'll see that it is kind of a problem. We're going to have some problems soon. We're having some problems getting people to work for us. And some, uh, some realities will be setting in in the coming years that the town may not, well, there are challenges for the town farther ahead is a way to put that. So um, just saying that, uh, how would you like to start going over the budget? Um, do you want me to answer that, Kathy? Yeah, why don't, why don't we go in? Uh, yeah, I mean, Guilford, if you want to give an overview, that would be fine. Uh, we've all had the budget book for a while. Um, the fact that DPW covers, you know, a fair portion of the budget book, as well as the um, uh, funds. But um, I think if you just quickly review which departments are in DPW, and then also um, the uh, various funds we're also going to look at today, just a, a word or two about them. And then I think we can start with the questions. And I'm sure okay. there's questions from other counselors as well. All right, that, that works for us. Works for me. Sorry. Um, so like, like Lynn said, there's several different divisions within the DPW. Um, we have, and we actually, as I like to call it, four types of money, four different colors of money. We have general fund money, we have water money, we have sewer money, and we have actually five, uh, water, sewer, general, transportation, and solid waste money. Um, we, cut, we use money from all those different uh, funding sources, as well as capital money. Um, so in the general fund side, we'll talk with, about them first. Um, we're made up of the administrative department, um, which are our clerks and office staff. They take work requests from people on the phone, see click fix requests. They funnel those out to the people they need to go to and they feed the information back in. Um, when we get to the questions, one of the questions is how does that work? And that's one of the answers to that, but we'll talk more about it. Um, the engineering staff I talked about is also in the administration fund. Um, there's five people upstairs. We have the town engineer, an assistant town engineer, we have an environmental scientist, and then we have two engineering technicians. Um, the engineering technicians and the assistant uh, town engineer spend a lot of time during this season uh, managing jobs. Um, one of the one of the in engineering technicians is out on uh, North Pleasant or Northampton Road right now, getting wet, um, overseeing and helping the state with making sure our part of that project goes in like we'd like it to. And our part of that project is installing a new water line before they pave the road. Um, we designed that water line replacement in-house. Um, that was done in-house and we passed that on to the state contractor who added it to the state design work. 
So <clears throat> inside engineering is a lot of expertise and a lot of capabilities. Um, the next group I'll talk about is the highway division. That's the largest group in the general fund side. Highway division, they handle all the roads, roadside mowing. Um, they also handle all the snow and ice. So this group, there's roughly two, two to three, there's three, actually three crews in it, two highway crews specifically, and then a, another crew which handles the sign maintenance. And it also handles the parking meters and parking, um, parking signage as well. So we have two people who handle the sign maintenance and parking meters. And then we have basically two crews that do the rest, which can range from replacing a manhole to flushing a sewer line to flushing a drain line to rebuilding a drain line to as far as actually taking out pipe and replacing water, I mean, replacing drain or sewer pipe. So the, they have quite the capability in that group. Um, the, as we go down the list in your chart and your organization chart, we'll just hit the next one, which is street and traffic lights. Street and traffic lights is actually a group that exists um, mainly just to hold the general fund money that we use in this, um, this endeavor. Um, we have two electricians on staff and they maintain just about everything electrical for the DPW. And they also do a lot of work for the rest of the town and um, the schools as well at times. Um, but traffic signals and traffic lights is here in this budget. This budget pays a little bit of personnel cost, but mostly this money goes to paying the electricity and the, uh, the cost of replacing a light or to do some upgrades or to make some repair. Traffic lights is the same. Um, there's no money for people in that account, there is money for maintaining the street lights and for actually paying for electricity. Um, equipment maintenance uh, is on is the next one on your list that's at the top on your uh, org chart on page on page 138. Right. Equipment maintenance is in the general fund. They um, maintain all our vehicles. Uh, they also get mo receive money from the enterprise funds to maintain the enterprise fund vehicles. So if you look closely at the budget, you'll see there's some transfers from the enterprise funds to the DPW. And most of that is to pay for some staff work, which is the administrative staff, and also to pay for equipment maintenance to repair their equipment. This is their trucks. It's not the equipment like in a water treatment plant or that the wastewater plant, but it's for their their vehicles. Equipment maintenance is mostly vehicles, um, snow plows, mowers, um, large machineries like the loader, the backhoe, the, mow the um, large John Deere mower we have to. So this group of three people maintain all those. Um, the next group is tree and grounds. Tree and grounds, as it is, they take care of all the shade trees. They also take care of all the grounds. Um, Mostly the grounds, the easiest way to think of the grounds is if, it, is if it's a large piece of grass, we mow it and we will do things for it. Um, Amy's smirking there. <laughs> uh, there are some overlap the, in the school department. We do some mowing for the school department, but then they do mowing too. So there's some little bit of overlap. Um, the town hall people, they have a small yard. They maintain their yard. The DPW doesn't maintain town hall. It doesn't maintain the yard at the um at the jones library either so tree and grounds like uh, maintains groff park they maintain mill river plum brook the commons and those types of things um, tree and grounds also does swimming pools kind of a neat thing um, and we have our new spray park uh, we do spray parks too uh, the spray park actually is working if anybody is concerned about it it does work and it will magically probably start working tomorrow and stay on for the season since it's going to be so hot this weekend. Just so anybody who's listening will know, you can pass the word around. Um, this, this group does all that. Um, this group also is responsible for our three cemeteries. Um, so they also will dig the graves and close the graves for people who, um, who pass on and that needs to be taken care of. So this, that group there has a, a lot of different things. And, and one of the, 
one of the things in this group is, is, and actually in all the general fund sides, is we're just not putting enough into the groups to give the service level that the town residents are asking for. More and more, the service levels are increasing, but the money is just not there. In 2005, the money for the highway or for the construction maintenance group that um, was budgeted for materials for that group was a hundred and was one hundred and fifty five thousand dollars. That was nine, that was two thousand five's budget. This year's budget, or actually the approved budget for FY twenty two, the number is roughly sixty thousand dollars. So over the years, we've cut that budget for material down, but then inflation has hit it, and people ask why we can't do as much as we used to do. Well, we just, it's not the money isn't there. I mean, we do use some general funds sometimes when we start running out of o and money, but operation and maintenance money has been reduced over the years, at least in that division, and then some of the other divisions as well. But that's the biggest one. So as you think about what's going on, even though, so, even though the budget lines are going up, that's mostly paying for people's salaries. The money to pay for the materials we're putting in the pothole or for the paint on the road or for signage, replacing signs, you can't read the sign. That, that money has gone down over the, since 2005. It's really, I brought my chart, I got my chart out and I was amazed to see it, but it actually has. And I, I can share it with other people they want it, but um, it's interesting. So that's the biggest thing that's going on in, in the, those general fund groups is what they do. And then money just isn't there and inflation is just eating it away. Um, the other groups we have, um, we do all water distribution and water treatment and the water, we're gonna operate the water reservoirs and that's in the water enterprise fund. The um, solid waste fund, it runs a transfer station. That's under our group. There's only three people in that group and they operate the transfer station. There's lots of talk about zero waste and trying to change how we do trash in Amherst. Um, I really look forward to talking about that. Um, one of the things I, that popped into my brain recently um, was the fact that everybody thought that we should have a single hauler in town so we could reduce the number of vehicle trips in a, a neighborhood. But as I was sitting in my neighborhood on a day off and I counted how many times the prime truck, the UPS truck, the FedEx truck went up and down the street, I realized even if you cut out all those garbage trucks, we've now, because of the pandemic, we've had this new paradigm where we have six or eight vehicle trips a day down the neighborhood street that we never had before because of so many, you got the prime truck, you got the prime truck plus the FedEx truck, you got the air truck, the ground truck. It's just amazing, but it would be good to talk about trash because trash is going up. The cost of disposal is going up. It's mostly tied toward towards um, the cost of handling equipment uh, fuel and equip, uh, employee cost. Um, and we'll probably have to look at raising our rates at the transfer station next uh, this coming July to meet some needs we have, which we didn't anticipate when we started talking about the budget back in November. But now uh, we're seeing rate increases from our, our disposal sites and um, they're quite significant. We have a 12, we're gonna have a 12% increase in trash disposal um, soon. That's coming. Um, Guilford, I'm sorry I need to interrupt you because we do have to call the council to order. So just one second. Uh, Kathy, do you want to check on whether Alicia can hear you? Uh, Alicia, um, we just check it, uh, voice and presence check, please. Hello. Yes, everyone, I can hear you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. And I, uh, I'd like to call the town council to order at 925. I've already checked to make sure that Anna Devlin Gothier can hear us and we can hear her. I'm calling on Pam Rooney. I'm here. I can hear you. Thank you. Dorothy Pam. Yes, I can hear you. Thank you. Thank you all. I'm sorry for that interruption. No problem. <laughs> um, it gave me a chance to stop talking. I was looking for a place to break. <laughs> um, 
So then we have the, the sewer division, our wastewater division. Our wastewater division works with our highway division in the conveyance and getting the sewage from your house to the wastewater treatment plant. You'll actually see in the budget, there's some line items which actually pay for personnel and equipment in the general fund to maintain the, the flushing truck, the flusher truck and to do the flushing. Um, the highway guys actually respond to all the overnight calls for uh, sewer blockages. And then the wastewater guys respond to all the calls for any type of pump station issue or wastewater plant issue overnight. Um, so there's a little crossover there and then we, cr we cross money over to compensate for that as well. But the wastewater division runs the wastewater plant specifically and runs our pump stations. We have how many, Amy? Uh, 22 pump stations. 22 pump stations. Um, one of the things we're looking for in this budget, if you and if you notice in the um, in the capital for wastewater, is that we're actually looking to replace one of our pump stations. It's a pretty significant number. Um, it's um, but it's something we need to do. Pump stations, pump stations are there to keep the the, the material flowing to the wastewater plant so they can be treated. Um, and that's one of the, we actually have some, a great many number of pump stations, more than most communities our size, which is something else. We try to compare our community to another community, just the miles of sewer and the number of pump stations we have are not common for a community our size. Um, and then we also, we're part of the transportation fund. We have one and a half people who work for the transportation fund. Predominantly, those one and a half people cover meter meter repairs, not changing the changing the money or collecting money, but we do meter repair and maintenance on the meters, which include the single post meters and the kiosk. Um, we also line the parking lots. Um, we sweep the parking lots. We uh, replace signage in the parking lots, and that all falls under our part of the transportation fund, um, right there. So overall, that's kind of the that's the whole big picture of public works and a little what we do um, and what the highlights are of the budget. So it might be better just to go to questions next if we want. Um, Gilford, I was thinking that you might want to introduce Amy because some of the counselors may not have met her, although I think you gave a great demo of what sludge looks like in sewers to at a council meeting to all of us. <laughs> So Amy Rizeki is the assistant superintendent. She's in charge of all the operations and most of the divisions, all the divisions report directly to her for the day-to-day -day operations. The, uh, she works with me and then the town engineer, Jason Skills, who manages almost all the, he manages all the construction projects we have. Um, we are, the three of us are the, the top of the pyramid and make, try to make sure all the, the balls keep moving in the, in the world. Um, so I sent a set of questions, uh, Guilford to um, Andy, who also sent them to Kathy, to Sean and to you, and I think I even CC Paul. So um, I can either ask those questions and have you talk about them, or you can just start with them. But as we go through, we might want to pause as we go through with each to see whether there are counselors who want to build on the question that I've asked. So, you know, if you would like, I will start with the questions. You can do the questions, that'll be fine. Great, okay, I'll be glad to. Um, let me just find my questions. Um, okay, so the first one was really about resident work requests. As counselors, particularly district counselors, uh, one of the issues we hear about uh, is requests to DPW for everything from potholes to water runoff to, you know, just goes on and on. How do you respond to these requests? How do you follow up and communicate with the complainant? And do you have a quality control system that basically shows how long it takes to respond or at least to let them know what's going on, how it takes, how long it takes to fix the problem, et cetera. Yes, we have a system. 
um, a, a lot of people a lot of people would like more from our system um, we would like it to do a little more than we have um, but we do have a system um, we use c-click fix we we did have another system that we were using but it actually got too expensive to keep paying the the software and the annual dues for it um, so we got rid of it so most, mostly residents will send, send us a request either through C-Click Fix or through an email or a phone call. Those that get entered into the emails and phone calls get entered into C-Click Fix. And then those get distributed, like I said earlier, to the division directors they're responsible for. Um, most of them get taken care of rather quickly. A lot get put into a bigger pile and get taken care of together. Potholes or potholes, you put a pothole request in. Unfortunately, we laid off the pothole ferry. So the pothole ferry doesn't go out immediately when you call in. It has to wait for the pothole guys. Um, the pothole guys get a group of potholes together in a certain area. And then we go work that area. And then the next day we'll work another area. Um, I wish we could bring the pothole ferry back, but I don't think we'll ever be able to do that. Um, so potholes are, are put together in a group to go out and work on. There are people who make a uh, call in with something that which is also not something that can be taken care of immediately. Um, sinkholes, those things we have to go through a process of calling in and making sure we have all the material to do it. We call into a dig safe, we get a dig safe, we have to get material sometimes. Sometimes they can't be repaired when a person calls in because it's the middle of winter and we'll just if the sinkhole is not bad enough, we'll just kind of let it sit until the weather gets better to do work on it. So a lot of things go into when we, when we actually get out and do the repairs. If, um, the biggest call we're getting right now is Bay Road is rough. Um, it's not pothole, it's just rough. All the pothole patching has made it a little uneven. Um, we are going to pave it. It won't be paved until probably closer to the August time period, then July, August time period. So we just have to wait for that, our paving contractor to come in. Um, we do do some feedback. Feedback could be better. We're working on that. Um, it's, uh, it's just something that takes time to work out. And with getting rid of the old program we had and just using C-Click Fix, it's kind of sometimes a little, a little bit of an issue because sometimes with C-Click Fix, you don't have to give any information of who you are, how to get back in touch with you. So we have no way of contacting everybody who calls in sometimes. Yeah, I was just going to add that if people like I would encourage people when they enter work requests in, if they want that feedback loop, if they like if they put an email, then they even just certain things, this has been forwarded to a division director, this work order has been complete, those emails will automatically go out. If people don't put that in, um, or don't give their email address, then that's, I think, where we, we it, there's not an automatic update as some of these things happen. And that's where the communication lacks a little bit, because we don't always have the manpower to, you know, call somebody back and give them an update. Um, so an email would be much faster. If, if people emails. would do emails, then it, it can auto-generate. And then if they have a question, they can certainly follow up and we can get them more details. But at least that, that automatic email in the system will give them some status updates. So I, I know that Bob has a question, but do, will the click and fix allow you to um, uh, and pull out and analyze a, like a monthly report or something that gives you a sense of numbers of calls, numbers of responses, how fast the responses were. I'm going back to the quality control question. It, it does and it doesn't. So if you just want to know calls and how fast they were taken care of, it can do that. But calls that get grouped with other calls, there's no way to track that and see click fix. Um, there's not a, and that's what the work order system we used to have did. You could take them and you can group them together and this make it into one work order. Then you can track that one work order. So you have some, you have some information that could come back from C click fix, but you don't get the full picture because of that grouping of calls we do together. Okay. Kathy, Bob, yeah. yeah, Bob, and, and I also have a question. So Bob, go ahead. 
Yeah, I just wanted to, to note that many software packages have um, a screen where certain information is required. Maybe you could modify the system so that an email is required in order to submit a work request. That might then increase your ability to, to track things. I don't know if you can do that or not with that software. We we did ask the click fix and they don't require it. They just you can be anonymous. So it's just we just need to tell people if you really wanted a response back, put an email address in there and we'll get an email back. Okay. I'm just gonna follow up on that if I, I don't want to get off my Zoom screen, but is that instruction to people in big bold letters when they go on to see click fix? Like if you if you want to hear back tell us who you are, you know, put in whatever field. Um, and then the second question, Guilford, just on this is the actual data, which is in your table on page 141, shows a big decline since uh, FY17. You know, it's down by not quite 50%. But do you have any sense of, of that? Are more calls coming in by phone? Not if this captures, I just was wondering why there's been such a drop off. It's, and it doesn't look like just this past year. It looks like it's been first a decline to 2018. And then uh, the last two years have both been even a bigger drop off. So I don't know whether COVID somehow has people no longer caring about potholes or, or whatever you're getting. So it's a question both, can you alert people to put the email in and why the drop off? So I, I don't remember, we've, we've talked to, I think it's been talked to uh, IT a couple of times about putting, rewording that, or putting that in the information when you fill out a C-click fix, but I'm not sure if it's there or not. Um, I don't use it that often, sorry. Okay, I know okay. we talked, I didn't, I haven't checked, I apologize. It's okay. Um, go for it, uh, um, go for it. I just went in and did a uh, pretend one and it says, if you would like the city to potentially connect, contact you regarding this issue, please leave your phone number below. So um, maybe there's something we can do there to, to just update that. Yep. So the, the, the real, I mean, the real drop off in the customer response work request there is the fact that we used to take the number of C-click fix calls. And then we used to take the number of work orders we generated on our work order system and add them together. Okay. And then when we got rid of the work order system, what you see in the last two, three years is actually more, um, more what people call in and it's, it's caught, captured on C-click fix. Okay, so it's, it's a, data, a, a data shift on the way yeah. you're capturing, yep. Okay, thank you. Okay. Are there any other questions on the issue of resident work orders and that whole thing? Okay, then let's go on to the next. The next was staffing. Um, are you having pro any problems recruiting and retaining personnel? Are there, there, there specific areas that are more difficult than others? What are the obstacles to recruitment and retention? And then another part was on page 139, you mentioned staff reorganization. Could you tell us what that means? So the answer is yes, yes, and yes to the first three questions. Um, we we like every other we like every other company and enterprise in them is having problems recruiting and we're having some problems retaining and um, it, it is getting to be it's beginning to be more of an issue than it's ever been since I've been here. Um, we are by nature the nature of the town of Amherst is we are a larger employer. We usually hire people um, who are looking to take the next step. They may have started somewhere in a smaller community. They come to our community, they get more experience and they go to a bigger community. Um, that's just kind of the nature of being a medium-sized medium -sized town or small city. It's just kind of, that's our nature. Um, recently, we've had several people, we've lost several people to larger organizations. Um, Springfield Water and Sewers one, um, and we we do spend a lot of time training people. Uh, I don't think we've hired 
anybody, well, we've only hired one person, I think, in the last year who actually had a, a water, a wastewater license. Everyone else we've hired had no license. They were interested in the field and had some background and we've got them, we have gotten them licensed. Um, and that, that goes we, back many years and that's water and wastewater. We hire people that are good workers interested in the field, maybe have some sort of experience or education, but we do the investment in getting them the license and getting them the experience. And some people stay with us and other people use that to then move on to you know, higher opportunities in other locations now that they're licensed and more qualified. Yeah, I mean, we have one operator in water. He came to us through a program through the VA for a job um, career training to, for a new job. And um, he's been with us for a long time, Matt Yoder. Um, excellent employee. He's one of our water operators. He's done everything we've asked him to, and he loves it. And he, Well, I don't want to say he loves it. It's work. Um, he enjoys working for us, and he's been with us for quite a while now, and he's been a success story. So we do use just about every means we can to try to attract people. We, uh, we tap into some of the um, uh, vocational programs. We try to get some of those students to come. We, we have actually one who just came from a vocational school now at Wastewater. He's starting his career and he looks very promising. Um, we have uh, several, we actually have one new mass graduate who just came to us maybe a year ago. Um, we have a UMass master's, he has a, did he get a master's or doctorate? Master's. It was a master's and then he did like a year of um research after he completed his master's. So he, he was ready to leave the educational world and come back into the um, working world. And uh, he has, his, he got his master's and now he's working for us. Uh, so we bring in a lot of people um, and we do have to do a lot of training. Um, the reorganization part that we need, that we're focused on right now is um, we've had a lot of retirements or, and we have a couple more to go. Um, the wastewater director retired and then his assistant who we were going to, who was going to be the director, he decided to go to another entity. So we had to shuffle in wastewater and get that reorganized. We have a brand new division director there, um, Andrew Brace. He's doing a great job. He has an assistant there, Andy Kaiser, Andrew Kaiser. He's the gentleman who came from UMass. Um, and then the existing staff is stepping up and doing a really good job. Um, to, to reorganize that. Um, so as you have a retirement and we plan for retirement and it doesn't actually go the way we planned, those are things we're having to work out. Um, we had a retirement in the office here, um, and Cheryl, Cheryl McNamee, who, um, who actually had been here 40 years, retired. 41, <laughs> 41 years. She, she left, she's been with the town 41 years. I think she's been with us, like she was with the DPW for 35 of those 41 years. Um, she basically started the town when she was 18 and has been here. So in our, and so we had a change in the office staff. So now we're trying to get people up to speed on what she was doing and also rearrange a little bit and balance out the workload a little more. Um, those, those are the things that we're facing. Uh, in the water division, we'll probably have the division director retiring there shortly. Um, he probably has less than less than five years. Um, he'll be leaving and we'll be adjusting there as well. So all these things are going on all the time and we're, we're, we're kind of balancing them out. So I want to go back to the issue of bringing people in who aren't licensed uh, and or need additional training and get a sense of how long that takes um, and the cost to us and whether there is a way to have an understanding that if we invest in you this way, you're giving us back uh, at least two more years or three more years or whatever the case. I mean, there, when, for example, faculty take sabbaticals from higher ed institutions, they either have to come back for a year or two years, depending on what they do, or they have to pay back the sabbatical. I'd be happy if you want to start a sabbatical program. 
No, I don't want this. I'm asking about the cost and the binding. I understand that. Um, in the wastewater and water side, it can take almost a year to actually get an operator up to speed and actually understanding our system. Um, the licensing is actually can go a little faster. Getting someone to be licensed is just a matter of going through the testing steps. In the water system, they've made it licensing. So you have to get your grade one first, then your grade two, and then your grade three. Um, and we're actually going to be a grade four system soon. So there's time periods and it takes a little longer to hop through all those little time hoops. Um, so it depends on whether it's water or wastewater or whether it's a truck driver or whether it's an equipment operator. We also bring them in. We bring in a lot of our um, highway and parks and tree, tree and grounds people in with no, no licenses at all either. And we have to give them, get them license, which is a commercial driver's license usually and then an operator's license. So the, the amount of time varies and the cost varies. Um, we, we probably spend at least uh, one to $2,000 just on the licensing requirements for water and wastewater. And then the rest of the time is, the rest of the cost is cost that's the supervisor's time getting that person up to speed versus doing what he's supposed to be doing and stuff like that. So it's a little hard to quantify the exact dollar cost it takes. We can tell you how much the, the specific classes cost, but the on the job training part is something we can't really put a figure on. And of course, the reason I'm asking all of these questions is because personnel changes cost money. And that's where the issue for this lies. So Kathy, do you want to see if other people have? Does, does anyone else have anything? Because I, I, this came up in a couple of different areas. You, you've already covered one. I was going to ask Guilford on retirement. It looks, I don't know whether you've had more retirements than you expected, but you noticed that you, you're facing um, you're looking forward to seeing several are coming. So it sounds like it's both the marketplace and retirement that's affecting you, right? Yeah. Bob. Yeah, I just wanted to add that, um, you know, I, I, I come from the private sector. I'm retired now, but um, you know, the company I worked for uh, would, in some cases, pay for classes, language classes, other things. But um, if there was a, a, a but associated, which is if you got that money, you had to work another two years or something like that. Otherwise, you had to pay the money back. So I, I do think that that is common practice, certainly in the private sector. I don't know about the public sector, but um, I, I would I think it's it would make sense to ex at least explore being able to do something like that. Can I jump in on that quickly? Um, I'm a, I'm a huge fan of that. Um, a couple of years ago, I think I reached my wits end with training <laughs> operators and then losing them to other systems. Um, you know, we, we packaged them nicely and then sent them off to their real job is what it <laughs> felt like. Um, like we were doing all the investment and not getting the reward. Yeah. Um, I, I believe some of the challenge though, is that everyone that works here, they have an association contract. They, they're basically a union. And so there, there's just the challenge of, you know, making it okay with that and writing that into their collective bargaining unit. Um, so I think it would just be a little bigger process. Um, but one that I'm, I'm, I advocate for, for sure. I, I'm just gonna add to that and say, Faculty at the University of Massachusetts and staff are unionized as well, and it had to get no negotiated into their contracts. Uh, I mean, this this is money that we're investing in people, and I think we have every right to expect some level of continuation with us for a period of time after that investment. So I see both Anna and then Bernie. Anna. Yeah. Hi. So I'm curious with, you said you've got a decent number of retirements coming up in the next five years. I'm curious if you're doing any sort of formalized succession planning for those roles. Um, I'm assuming that, you know, folks who are retiring have hypothetically been here for a, lo a, a little bit longer um, and to replace those roles directly would cost a little bit more because there's training. And so I'm curious if you have any 
succession planning program set up so that you can move folks internally into those roles as appropriate um, and, and then hire kind of quote unquote lower down that ladder, right? So that you can build a pipeline. Um, and also, you know, that encourages employees to stay, et cetera, et cetera, when they see potential for growth and all of those good things. I'm, I'm just curious about what you've got in play for that. Thank you. So in wastewater, we had a really good succession plan set up for our wastewater direct vision director when he retired. But then when it came to offer it to the, the, the next person, we didn't have a compensation plan that could compete with the outside world. So our, our succession plan fell apart. Um, our next retirement is in water. We have that just the one in water so far coming up that we know of in the immediate future. Um, if we go out farther, there's a few more. If we go out farther, there's probably four more. Um, but in the immediate future, and water, we've already kind of been working with the person we think is going to probably be the next person to take over. And we've been planning with that person. The only issue will probably come up to the same thing is when we get ready to offer the position, how they feel about the um, how they feel about the compensation for taking the position. Sean has his hand up. Yeah, yeah, I was just going to say, um, so in the DPW contract, there is an education assistance program where um, we will pay for um, courses potentially if it's as part of the job. And that program does require that um, the staff continue working for us for 12 months or they have to pay back part of that. Now, I don't know if that fits in perfectly with the types of things that Guilford and Amy were talking about if they're sort of specific certifications that may not fall under that. Um, but we do have th that the a broader education or course would be covered under that. And that was just recently added the last time we did the contract. I just brought that up too. So Bernie, you had had your hand up. It went down, did? Yeah, I think um, Sean's fairly well answered the question. I was just gonna point out the fact that uh, the town attorney has a pretty substantial labor law practice and it might be, um, beneficial to bring them in to try and resolve this issue because it does pop up with other employees too, particularly with police officers, um, you know, getting trained and going through the academy, getting trained and then moving on. So, uh, but it, it sounds like people are making some steps in that direction. So thank you. So I think I'm not seeing any other. So Lynn, let's move on. Okay. Given the size and broad span of DPW's responsibilities, you have various ways you can impact and help meet the climate action goals and the many opportunities described in the CARP plan, which is the climate action plan. Um, purchase of vehicles, maintaining open space, et cetera. Does DPW have a plan on how it will contribute um, with, to the achievement of these goals over time? Um, the short answer is really no. Um, we have not found anything on the equipment side. We're not really seeing any equipment that's going to contribute immediately to these goals that have been set. Um, so we haven't set up a plan to actually start phasing out the, some of our vehicles for electric vehicles. Um, there just isn't isn't that the, the equipment hasn't got there. Um, you can buy a loader that's a battery, electric powered battery loader. Um, it'll work for eight hours a day or nine hours a day, um, but then it requires at least an eight hour to 10 hour charge time um, on the market right now. The problem with that is, is when you go into a snowstorm, we can work 24 hours. So do we buy a loader that's, one and a half to two times the cost of a conventional loader to meet the climate plan, knowing that we won't be able to use it all the time when we need it, or do we wait and buy a more efficient fuel, a more efficient fossil fuel version that will take us to the next point? Hopefully, by that time, there's something in the equipment size that'll work. Um, we are starting to look at some of the smaller um, ground mowers. Um, Alan Snow, the division director in Tree and Grounds, he's actually identified a few that might work for him 
and might be allowed to let us start shifting our smaller mower, mower fleet over. Um, so that's something we are working for. In our buildings and in, in our buildings and operations as our building, we've actually been doing a lot of the climate action goals since before I got here. Um, we're always looking to increase the efficiency of our motors, our pumps, our controlling devices. We've participated with Eversource. I think the first day I was here, I had to sign off on one of the agreements that Eversource paid for 50% of a new motor in the wastewater plant just because it was gonna be more energy efficient. And we continue to do that. LED lighting, we, we've converted all our buildings to LED lighting, um, whether it's the right spectrum or not. Um, the power savings has been very good. Um, the street lighting, we converted those to LED lights. Um, there's been a great savings there and, and money, but we've mostly are driven by cutting our dollar footprint, not our carbon footprint. But as we cut our dollar footprint, we are reducing our carbon footprint at times. Um, but we haven't really truly been able to grab anything that's in the climate action goals and truly start planning to implement any of that yet. I see, I see both Dorothy um, and Sean. Dorothy? Um, I'm, I'm not sure, okay, I'm trying to do the picture and I can't do it, okay. I'm, I'm not sure it, it would, what Gilford just said about <clears throat> um, Alan Snow. Are you talking about leaf blowers? Does the town use gas powered leaf blowers? Because there's been a lot of um, complaint from many, many directions about their use. And uh, that seems to me something that I know that, that it's an expense to change over equipment, but that seems to be something that the town could do now. Um, so just interested in the response. So yes, we've looked at leaf blowers. We've looked at um, the smaller, the, 50, the 52 to, and 48 inch deck riding mowers we have, and some of our smaller weed eaters and so forth. We've looked at those. Um, we could switch over now. Uh, the problem being is, is they do cost more than a conventional machine. And we do have to, we do have to have more batteries and more charging capability with our equipment as we go through the day. So we would have to have some way of charging those batteries, whether we have a trailer that's solar powered that can charge the batteries as we're working, or we have to go back to the shop and drop the batteries off and change the batteries, or we have to buy enough batteries that you can work the whole day and then go back to the shop and let them charge overnight. There are little, there are little issues we're working on, but we are, we do think that the Allen's, the tree and grounds um, equipment is probably gonna be the first place we start looking into some of this stuff. And we do use gas powered blowers. Mm -hmm. Right now, unfortunately, they, they are the most efficient for the times we use them. Uh, that would seem to be something that that's some of the state money and grants could do to the, to uh, pay for all the expense of the transition and the things you mentioned. So, Sean, your hand was up, but it did go back down. Yeah, I was just going to um, a few quick things. I think all the departments are struggling with the vehicle element of the CARP, um, mainly just because of the technology and the availability of some this, uh, like the police department, it's a little easier because of the types of vehicles they use, but um, the departments that use larger vehicles, I think that's going to continue to be a struggle. Um, I was going to see if Gilford wanted to speak a little bit more about, there's a couple pieces in the cart that I think um, you have done some planning on, and that's related to like stormwater management and some of the reclaimed water and reused water. I know those are two pieces within the cart that um, you guys are doing a lot of uh, planning around. Yes, I mean, the, the stormwater part is all part of our stormwater permit, and we're doing a great deal with that. Um, that's all, but we're looking at it not so much from the CARP as we are from our permit requirements. And probably, I think we, we talked about it last in our own staff, we probably have about another two years of things we need to do for our permit before we can actually start deviating off and start doing things that we have in the CARP and things that we want to kind of address that. Um, more climate, more climate related than the permit related. So we are, we do have that, but it's a little, it's a year or two out, probably two years out based on what we have to do for the permit. 
Um, reuse water is something we've been working on since for the last 18 years, we've been working on reuse water and we've been supporting the reuse water project with UMass. Um, they may be going a different direction with their reuse water. Um, so at, if that does happen, we should know shortly within the next, well, we should have known this month or last month. Um, hopefully we'll know at the end of June. Um, if, if they go a different direction, we will probably also take our reuse water and put it on the back burner for a little while until it's uh, more um, profitable for the town to actually uh, install the system for town reasons, not for UMass and town reasons. Kathy? You're muted, Kathy. I was muted, I'm sorry. Anna, um, please unmute. Thank you. Uh, so, all right, I, I get it with the things like plows that yes, you could reasonably, you know, expect 24 hours. But I do think, you know, the, the things that do reasonably only run for an eight, eight hour shift kind of at the max, um, or at least during daytime, right? I, I, it would be really great to see some sort of phasing plan for those things. And I recognize that a lot of that is probably what you were saying, right, is, is more um, trees and grounds. But I, I think it's also important to consider when these things are being used and, and for how long, right? Like realistically, there are some things that need to be equipped to be able to run for more than the charge time, right? But, but I think it's also important to recognize or, or maybe to kind of consider which vehicles can we use um, for, for only, sorry, which vehicles would we only need to use for eight hours that we then could allow to charge for the next shift or whatever, right? Like it goes for one person's eight to 10 hour shift and then and then charges again. And, and the phasing plan for that could be, um, could be really beneficial just to kind of consider as, as we go and as these vehicles continue to be more available and more uh, affordable. I agreed. And that's why we say the, the smaller stuff that's in the tree and grounds division is actually showing itself to be the most, most usable in this area. And we'll, we'll probably, we'll probably experiment with one or two pieces of equipment in the next year or so and see how that goes. I, I more just wanted to clarify on that point. Cause I think sometimes when we're thinking like the equipment that plows and that works overnight, we think the highway division but it is actually basically every single truck in our fleet is out there. We have staff from you know water and wastewater and tree and grounds and everything. And so um, great, definitely a great point, Anna, that we need to look at, but it's, it's a small number of our, our, our fleet, um, unfortunately. Um, yeah. So we have to focus on the smaller equipment where we can make a measurable difference. Okay, thank you. I think we can move to the next. Okay. Um, and Guilford, this is this question is really more to help people understand the breadth of the issues you deal with. Um, many issues, challenges, and opportunities for DPW depend on various federal and state agencies and regulations. For instance, U.S. and State Department of Environmental Protection and issues related to water, PFAS, et cetera. Um, can you just give us a sense of all of the different agencies uh, that you must work with that regulate the work you do? And you may wanna provide that to us in a separate list, but just give us a sense of some of it now. And I know Amy, you have some of these very strong connections as well. Um, I you, my you want guess, but please go ahead. Well, do you want the list we must work with or we try to avoid to work with? Well, no, I think must work with is where we need to go. <laughs> so in, in the water side, um, in the water side, the state of Massachusetts has control over water issues. So we work with uh, Massachusetts Department of Environmental Protection, predominantly on the water side. Um, DCR is actually also involved in those conversations with water. They help set the permit requirements and safe, um, safe water drinking yields and so forth. So we work with DCR. Um, we work with um, Mike. You might want to not use acronyms. Oh yeah, DCR is Department of Conservation and Recreation. Um, yes. We 
we work with them. Um, many of the other environmental agencies of the state, I won't give their acronyms, but there's the Fish and Wildlife people and um, Ecological Restoration. Those people also get involved in some of the water stuff we work with as well. Um, on the stormwater side, the main controlling group in the stormwater side is actually the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, um, Region 1. They manage stormwater in Massachusetts because they haven't given delegation to the state yet. So we work predominantly with the EPA on that, but the state also has its rules. So the Department of Environmental Protection Stormwater Group is working with us on that. And then when you start working in the stormwater world, you also bring in more, depart more agencies of the state as well. Um, we have had to also work with the Coast Guard for stormwater because the navigable waters of the United States is controlled by the Coast Guard and Army Corps. Um, U.S. Army Corps of Engineers has been involved in some of our work as well for permitting. Um, we, we, stormwater just gets to be wild, it gets to be wild and crazy. Um, in the wastewater side, uh, the state also doesn't have control in the wastewater side. The primary control agency is the EPA again. So we work with the EPA wastewater side. Um, and then we also have the state agency, the, the state Department, Department of Environmental Protection's wastewater people in there as well. Um, when we work in wastewater, we also get introduced into a bunch of people who are doing uh, like the Long Island Sound Committee for keeping the Long Island Sound, cleaning up the Long Island Sound, the working groups. Um, some of them are under EPA, some of them are, are private groups, um, but they're um, Connecticut River Valley, uh, River, Connecticut River, Connecticut River Association, right? Yeah. Um, they have things they, we work with them on because they're working on trying to keep the Connecticut River clean and that's where we discharge our, our wastewater to. Um, so there's a group, a group of people there. Um, on the highway side, we're working with Mass DOT a great deal, and Mass DOT and Federal Highway get involved with work we do. Um, so that that is going on. And then DOT our, Department of Transportation. Keep going, Guilford. Everyone knows DOT. Don't everybody's got to know that one. Um, the uh, the in the in the. And actually in the tree and grounds division, we actually end up working with some really interesting groups. Um, we, because we uh, run this, run the cemetery, we're also, there's some issues with uh, our board of health and with the state boards that control the disposition of bodies and so forth. And we have to deal with that plus tracking, um, tracking where we, tracking the people we bury. Um, in turn, tracking the people we in turn, sorry. Um, and then there's, there's a whole slew of them. And then almost every day we're, we're, de we're dealing with the town conservation commission. We're dealing with uh, environmental protection for the state environmental protection for wetlands and endangered species. Um, the uh, MEPA, MEPA requirements, which are the mass environmental, the bigger requirements um, for that actually can trigger whether you have to do a full environmental impact study or not do a full environmental impact study. Those are things we have to think about just about every day when we're doing projects with roads and water and drainage. Um, oversight by agencies outside the town is quite a big thing we do. I think I got most of them. I might yeah. have left a few out. Right. right. Uh, but building on that, do we have, uh, this is a probably a dangerous question to ask, but of the various things that are considered to be contaminants like PFAS, um, what would you say are issues that Amherst itself has a, a problem or a potential problem with? So we've been required to do PFAS sampling. Um, all our samples came back negative. So as an emerging contaminant, our watershed and our um, area of town is not um, threatened by PFAS. The bigger issues we're going to face are more um, bigger global stormwater issues, nitrogen, phosphates, and um, just volume. Um, so the nitrogen and phosphate is mostly going to come from um, our, our wastewater system and what we can uh, discharge into the Connecticut River. 
Um, and then we're also going to see those contaminants in our stormwater requirements. There's some TMDLs, which are total maximum daily limits, which are going to be set for our stormwater and our wastewater discharge. A lot of that is still being worked out. We have some of the TMDLs, but we don't have all of them. Um, those are coming down the, the pike as well. Um, something that is just now getting a lot of attention is PFAS and wastewater. Mm -hmm. um, and that, if you've been following the stories in Maine where you have farmers who are out in the middle of nowhere and their wells are now contaminated with PFAS because they actually applied land, applied sludge to their farms for fertilizer because that was a good thing to do then, they're now having PFAS problems. So I imagine PFAS will also start to be looked at in the wastewater side too, but that hasn't really happened yet. So those are nitrogen phosphates, TMDLs um, are the big things that we're kind of looking at right now as being kind of threats to us. When I, at, when I wrote the question, I couldn't remember what PFAS stands for. Maybe one of the two of you can come up with it. That's an Amy thing. Yeah, it's, it's per and polyfluorinated carbons are like, yeah, it's, it's basically they're forever chemicals, but it's, it's a product that was used for a long time to make you know, your nonstick pan not sticky and to make your raincoat waterproof um, and that sort of thing. But now they're finding that because of the structure of that chemical to make it so resilient and make it nonstick and waterproof and all those things, it means it doesn't break down over time in the environment. And so um, that, that's, the, that's the hazard with them. Okay, thank you. Um, that may, it, to some people, not seem like a financially related issue, but it's a very definite financially related issue. For new counselors last year, I think it was, we did two bylaws to bring us to move us up to state standards and uh, Guilford and Amy are in the process of implementing those bylaws and there are some costs associated with coming up to those standards. One was stormwater and the other one was? It was the IDDE with the illicit discharge and what's the other Illicit date? discharge and elimination program. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks. Uh, those were very exciting presentations. Um, <laughs> any you can't sleep, on, invite us to a meeting. Yeah, right. Uh, any follow-up questions on either of the, or any of that before I move on? I guess my only follow-up is, do, are these, these are outside testing agencies if we're doing something with soil. So I know there was an issue here um, that Rob Moore got involved with of uh, taking down a building. They made it keep the um, cement base of it because underneath it, that there were fumes. There's, it's an old trucking site. So do you get involved with any of that or is that just something that's on your radar screen that someone else is looking at? Um, is that a, a different entity that is, uh, that, that's my question on the contaminants issue. We get involved in it if it's in the public way or if it's uh, one of the buildings and that we operate, we'll get involved in that, but we don't get involved on private property with it. Okay, thank you. And we do get involved if it's leached across into something we own too sometimes. Bernie. Yeah, um, in, in that laundry list, um, Guilford, you, you failed to mention public safety. Um, the, the DPW is the third component in our, our public safety response, and, and uh, uh, people should keep that in mind as well. Uh, I, I get to harangue uh, Guilford and Amy about twice a month from the Transportation Advisory Committee, so uh, uh, I should add my thanks there. I had a question, and it may not this may not fit with our current uh, talk, but it relates to the federal infrastructure infrastructure money, which is going to be um, likely to hit beginning in fall. Um, that offers both prospects and problems, and I would like you to know, just to talk about that for a little bit. Yes, there's prospects and promises there, but. How the biggest thing is we don't know how it's going to be implemented yet. We're hoping it's a we're hoping it's a very uniform method where it's 
more like the chapter 90 program where the town's so big, has so many miles of money of roads or so many miles of water lines or so many miles of sewer line and you get this amount of money from the program. That's kind of how we're hoping it's going to run, but we're not really seeing much yet. Sean and town manager Paul Bachman may have the more information on how they're actually formulating those. Yeah, I mean, we don't have much more to add from what Guilford said. I think we've heard a lot of uh, funds are going to become available for infrastructure and for green projects, but we haven't seen actually how those will be distributed yet. Um, there's some applications coming up, I think, that will be applying for different things, but we haven't, um, again, we haven't gotten more detail on how they'll be distributed. Yeah, and when we bring up sort of looking at specific projects for general funds uh, with, with uh, representatives from uh, Congressman Govern, uh, they basically say, oh, there'll be a special, th this this is a water project, wait for it. There's gonna be a lot of water mo money coming through. This will be a sewer project. There's gonna be a lot of sewer money coming through. So let's hold those for those projects. Okay, but it's also gonna engender some competition because when we go to hire contractors, um, it may be become more difficult given all the federal money flowing down. And Bernie, to your point, I think one, one thing we are working on that um, we've talked about with Gopher and we've talked about with Stephanie is trying to have projects ready to go for when those pro when those funds come out because the more shovel ready or the more developed they are, the better chance we have if they are competitive, if the grant itself is competitive, if the funds are competitive. Um, you know, we'll be in a better position to get those. So um, that is on our radar to try to have those projects ready. Super, thank you. Lynn, so, right. yep. Okay, uh, this one's on building maintenance. Uh, in addition to your own buildings, I've always gotten a sense that you help do some maintenance on other town buildings that are not DPW. And could you talk about that and how those are paid for? Uh, and then also, is DPW involved with our new head of maintenance on the development and maintaining building plans with some kind of schedule as to what we should be doing regarding building maintenance? And I just want to add, the ongoing issue of building maintenance um, has been on a conversation in the council uh, as long as we've had a council, is just the upkeep of our existing buildings. So um, we, we do maintain some building. I mean, we do help with the maintenance of the buildings. Mostly, mostly it's, it's big things. Or actually, some of it's little, I guess I say both. Um, the electrician is the biggest thing we do. Our electricians will come. I think we were at the bank center. We were at the bank center earlier this week looking at a piece of equipment that got... Um, struck by lightning, we ordered the parts and we were in the next day putting it in. Um, so I hope the bank center is back working now. It was actually uh, uh, an air, air exchanger, air handler that got broken. Um, so immediate things like that, our electricians usually show up. Water issues, we do a lot of little water things. If you don't need a plumber, but you have a water issue, we show up for those. Um, we've been tasked to come or been asked to come and deal with some sewer backups at some of the buildings because we can take the vector and we can clean out the service lines and stuff. Um, when we do, we do electrical work or something like that, usually the building maintenance fund pays for the work we do. It doesn't pay for our time. It pays for the equipment we order or the parts we order. Um, we do mow some of the buildings. Like I said earlier, we mow around we mow the big area around the, the uh, Munson Library. We mow around the um, North Amherst Library. Um, I think we were doing part. Of, we were doing the big field behind the fire station at one time. We may not be doing that anymore, but we were doing that one. Um, those things are just things we do. We're not really reimbursed for those. Um, as far as being involved in a discussion about a bigger building maintenance. Um, that's been on the table that we need to start talking about it. We've been kind of sidetracked by the pandemic and stuff, but um, there has been discussions, small discussions about it, and we hope to get more, more of that going on. Um, we are going to be starting in the DPW. We have to, we're, we're going to more formalize our asset management plan. We're going to start with the water department and that I'll actually talk about many of the things you're talking about here, roofs for buildings, paying for buildings, uh, doing things like that for buildings. They'll be in the asset management plan and in a more detailed, um, 
a more detailed scope of work for when they need to be done and when they need to be looked at. And that's something we'll be starting with water and we'll probably go to wastewater next and then to the next, the rest of the public works buildings with. Paul, I see your hands up. Yeah, so yeah, just to add to that. So really DPW, facilities are responsible for the town buildings, but they do call DPW and DPW is really responsive, especially if we need an electrician or someone uh, like Guilford said, and there's, and it helps us a lot because it's, it's, it saves us money, it saves the town money. Um, and also um, they're just read, readily there and the schools I think draw on them occasionally as well. Um, it's basically just a team effort on, on those types of things. I know it takes it away from other jobs that those folks have, um, but it's a, it's, very, it's a pretty good relationship in terms of the facilities management. Our facilities manager is responsible for building that kind of um, maintenance schedule and he's working on that building by building, except for the DPW. DPW maintains their own buildings and they need to, to what, just what Guilford said, they're gonna be working on that same kind of asset management program. So, um, it, you know, it, there is, um, I, mean, I think we maintain our buildings pretty well. Um, the buildings that we've inherited, we don't, in, you know, they come in in poor condition. So I find it hard to be responsible for that. Um, and, and so, um, but it is a cost that we need to account for as we go forward, as, as, especially as we look at building new buildings. So um, I just have a quick process question that maybe Athena or Paul or Lynn can answer. Andy is in the audience as an attendee, but he's on a phone and Athena said she can't promote him, but I need to count him for us to have a quorum of the finance committee because it appears that both Michelle and uh, Alicia are not with us right now. And we need, I believe we need three members of the council the five of us, is that correct? So Andy is here, he's just in the audience. So I just wanna acknowledge that we still have a quorum. And Lynn, I think we're one short of a quorum of the council right now because I'm not seeing two counselors that were here that are both. So it's all right, it's all right to continue, correct? Um, yes, good, thank you. Yeah, and Sean, you have your hand up and then I have another question that builds on the maintenance issue. Yeah, so just it, it's this was related to a question Andy sent in to me. Um, mm. So he asked about how the DPW works with the regional schools and some of the services they provide to the regional schools. And I think Guilford touched on some of those. They do a lot of the field maintenance. Um, we rely heavily on DPW or the region relies heavily on the DPW to tell tell them when the fields can be used after it rains. That's a sort of a newer system that was put in place. Um, and I know DPW does a lot to maintain the region's pool. Uh, that's another big piece that they rely heavily on um, DPW staff for. So those are a few of the things. I'm sure there's others. Gilbert or Amy, if you want to add. Uh, usually when we do something else for the region, um, we do get called in sometimes for potholes. They asked us a pothole this year, but we could, just couldn't get to it. Um, we sweep the schools. Every year we sweep the schools and they actually pay for the sweeping. Um, we do do line painting in the schools. They pay for line painting. Um, there's other things we do on a case by case basis that pop up. I, I'm just gonna add with several of the town buildings and with the schools, I feel like we always get roped in every year to help with um, the treating during a snowstorm and then helping them plow because they they often just don't have the, the capability to do it as efficiently as we can. So building on Andy's question, uh, that was why I said I had an additional question. Does Do the schools then compensate us for work we do, especially the regional schools? Some they do, some they don't. If, um, if, we're, if we're preparing a field for a regional football game, they don't compensate us for that. If we're going through and they're, uh, we're, we're treating, the, treating the parking lots after a snowstorm, we send them a bill for the salt and they pay for the salt material. They don't pay for their labor. Um, if we are going to this, we're working on the soccer field lights right now. Um, they pay for all the equipment. They don't pay for the labor. So all the material that was bought for that, they pay for it. Um, so some they pay for, some they don't pay for. And this question goes back and Guilford probably knows it goes back probably forever um, in terms of since he's been here trying to quantify um, sort of the exchange of services because there's lots of things the town provides to the region that the region doesn't pay for. There's some things the region provides to the town that the town doesn't pay for. Um, 
use of space for recreation and I, I don't know if we if the town paid for town meetings and things like that when they use the auditorium so so it's always been this sort of understanding that there's going to be some shared services um and i know but we are when we can we do try to quantify and one of the things gilford and i are working on now with amy are just sort of identifying all the things that dpw provides to different people in town and what are the payment mechanisms for those different um, activities so that if we do want to make changes in the future um, we'll have a basis to start from okay kathy shall i go on yep please do thank you um under the um street and traffic lights you mention in your statement on one page 153 the number of street light trouble calls peaked in FY21. Can you give us some insight into what's going on? We think it was just everybody was released from COVID restrictions. The, the general release of, because actually we had a lot of our streetlight complaints kind of peaked during the during COVID lockdown because people were at home, they could see their streetlight more and they were like, why is it still on? Or why is it so bright? Uh, um, but then again, everyone could drive around again and the traffic lights didn't seem to be doing what they were supposed to be doing again. So um, we got a lot of calls for people just saying stuff like that. And um, we, we think that's what the reason for it. Um, there isn't any, the only real issue we've had with our street lights, and I'll go ahead and uh, that's probably something we should talk about is we had um, some failures in the pedestrian buttons and they weren't working right downtown. And I think there's a capital improvement project that was approved to actually replace all those. But that was, those were some additional calls that we didn't anticipate. People were out walking more after the pandemic and the buttons weren't doing what the buttons are supposed to do, which is beep and chirp and tell you it's time to walk. Okay. Kathy, Bob has his hand up. Bob, go ahead. Yeah, just to, um, since we're on that page, and what is a traffic light knockdown? Is that literally a, a light post being knocked over? Yes. Um, we have some traffic lights that are just on the small 12 foot or yeah. 12 foot poles and they're in yeah. the corners and intersections. And usually a tractor trailer will wrap around it when it's making a right or turn or left turn and it's a tight intersection. Sometimes we truly have a, a, a vehicle hit it. Uh, a small car will hit it because they're going too fast to the intersection, but it truly is a knockdown. Unfortunately for us, fortunately for us, we've never had one of the big poles knocked down, which is good. It's always the small poles. And I just, um, up in North Amherst, Bob, we used to have a light that got knocked down regularly, you know? <laughs> and so, so just on that intersection, what's your perception of how well the smartness of the smart light is working in terms of adjusting for traffic flow east west, um, you know, and 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 that's one question. You know, is it is it able to adjust that sometimes a day it's worse in one direction versus another, and can it self adjust or do you have to do it? And then my other is at one point when you were installing that, which turned out you staff could do it all by themselves and save us a lot of money, which was great. You were going to install the ability to count cars, count people and count bikes. And I'm just by observation, it feels like we're having a lot more flow than we used to. And it's partly because those uh, North Square apartments are now full and there are people in them. And it's something we anticipated. So is it, can it count and are we counting? And then do you have a sense of the flow is, I get re complaints about flows, but I don't know whether you get complaints about flows. Um, so we do get complaints about flows. They go out there and they'll, they'll analyze the situation and watch it for a while. Um, the, the biggest, I'm going to be polite. I'm sorry. I, I may say this wrong if I say it wrong. Um, the biggest problem with the intersection are people who do not pay attention to the light. Um, they will stop. Um, they'll be doing something in their car. Don't know what they're doing in their car. <laughs> um, and then the light will change and they won't move. So then the light thinks, well, why didn't anybody move? Um, there no, must be no one there. So it might take off a couple of seconds off the cycle for that leg when it doesn't need to take off seconds from that cycle. 
So then someone will beep and then they'll realize and they'll move, but then it won't be. So that's the biggest issue we're seeing is people not paying attention to the light when you're, you know, um, soapbox time, I'm sorry. When you're driving, please drive. When you need to do something else, stop somewhere and do something else. Um, but don't just drive, um, pay attention to what you're doing. Um, that's the biggest problem we're seeing. Um, it does the light, we never, we haven't found a good system yet for counting pedestrians, bikes and bicycle, uh, pedestrians, bicyclists and vehicles all at the same time. So we haven't put that system in yet. So we haven't been counting. We're still trying to find a system that we can get that'll work. Um, we've been talking to a couple of people. There's a company called Rhythm we're talking to now. Um, we might be able, they might have what we really want to use. Um, so we haven't been counting. Um, traffic volumes are up and predominantly the intersection works well, except um, it works well most of the time. I don't, when I go through to go home, I don't get really stopped. Um, I can make it through in one cycle. But during peak hours, like when I was driving through it after graduation, I set through three cycles of the light, um, but there were a lot more cars and things were changed. So that's really what we're finding. Amy wants to say something else. Yeah. And I more just want to chime in on that particular intersection. So it does, you know, add and subtract time based on how many cars are queued up. So that's the smart part of this. Um, Guilford, correct me if I'm wrong, but like three to six months ago, we took a deep dive after we just kept getting all complaints that things weren't working right. And we actually took a deep dive and found that there was, we, we made like kind of a, a more major change to um, the timing, the programming on the timing. And so I think we had a lot more calls before that. And we don't, we haven't since we made that change. So there was just something that we realized in the, the cycle of how it, I think basically if somebody pushed a pedestrian button rather than it saying, okay, I was just going this way. So now I'm gonna go this way. It just started at the top of the cycle every single time. And so at times it just kept queuing up in some directions because it kept, it kept starting with, okay, I, I go back to the, if it gets interrupted, it goes back to the start of the program. So, um, so I wanna thank you for that. And at least yeah. one of the residents up here wrote me, did you do something? Because I think it's better. So the answer is, you did do something. You know, a perception that it got better. So, th so it sounds like complaints help. Um, well, and in that in that yeah. case, um, it was it was a couple of police officers who got a call and they went up and they watched it and they came in and they said, "We noticed this really weird thing." Um, so it took someone really observing it and taking the time to watch it, to notice it. So I'll, I'll give credit to the police department, um, a couple of officers for noticing that and then coming in and um, letting us know so we could take the time to look for that glitch and fix it. So thanks very much. Hopefully okay. it doesn't come back. So Kathy, I wanna note that Michelle Miller is back. So okay, there's great. no question of a quorum for great. either body. Um, all right. so. Uh, equipment maintenance. What is the time frame for implementing the digitized vehicle maintenance schedule? We've been we've been saying this is a priority for many years. Right. That's why I'm um, asking. It actually it's actually a lower priority than some of the other things. So it usually just drops off this drops off the work table, and we we keep saying we want to do it, but it never gets done. Um, when we start playing with the, and doing our uh, we start building our new asset management system. There's actually availability to add vehicles into the asset management system we're working on for water and we'll be doing for wastewater. So that'll actually give us a chance to actually look at adding them in and being a little more, a little more thorough and getting that done. Um, but it is out of all the things we do that kind of just keeps falling off because it is a lower priority. And I assume that the asset management system Sean will feed into the capital inventory. Uh, no. hopefully, well, hopefully. I mean, we, we don't know yet until we have one, but I think um, I think if there if the asset management system has every vehicle in it and it can and it can um, produce a list, we can use that as a as sort of a check against our inventory to make sure we have everything covered. We may be able to start adding maintenance costs to the inventory in the future, potentially, if it provides that level of detail. Um, you know, so there may be some some additional pieces of information if it's if we can pull it out efficiently um, that we could add to it. 
Guilford, any other comment? We're not expecting to be at that level for many years. Um, the asset management requirement we're being working on is something that's being required by one of those great people we talked about earlier, um, the Department of Environmental Protection. So we're gearing more towards water and wastewater to start, and that's kind of how we set it up um, to move the process along as quickly as we need to because we have a time period under the Department of Environmental Protection to do it. Um, the pro program is a box program that's managed by one of the consultants we have. And um, if we want to do, when we start pulling it out and doing other things with it, we're just going to have to, it will be a year or two at least, it'll actually be two or three years before we're at that point. And then there's, there'll be more to it and more cost associated with it. Okay. But it can do vehicles and we're hoping to do vehicles. Right. So even though this next question is under equipment maintenance, it really applies across the board. And it's the issue of whether your FY23 budget takes into account inflation for everything from fuels to equipment, et cetera. No. Yeah. So, so we've, so, looked at, we've looked at our fuel budgets and I think we're gonna be, it's one of those things we're gonna have to keep an eye on closely. So we've, when we look back, we've had some flexibility in those lines um, where that would cover some of the inflation impacts that we're seeing. But I think the the amount that it's gone up, if it stays at that level for the entire year, it's going to be a concern. Okay, so we the, can, the, go ahead. The, easy, the easiest way to remember that is we start the budget process in November, right? So all these numbers you're seeing are November's that were put the, are numbers that were put together in November. They have not, they you know nothing about Ukraine and nothing about the fuel prices going up and the right. baby formula shortages. Those numbers had no impact at that time. Right. This, so my, my, my follow-on question with that one really is, this always relates much more to Sonia, and that is that as we do the quarterly review on our budget, are we going to be able to identify where inflation is impacting us um, in, and in what areas? Because um, while it seems to in some ways leveled off, it doesn't seem to be going down. It's just really, it, I can answer that. It should really start to show up in the second quarter. Okay. I mean, we can compare it to the previous years and you will see whether it's up or level. So we do that line by line so we can figure that out. Okay. Um, any other comments before um, we move on? Well, I just, yeah. along with that, Guilford um, indicated that it looked like we might have to do a fee increase for the... Um, I think of it as the town dump, but you know, and we the solid waste. So, if we're going to do that fee increase, do we need to do it before the beginning of the year to cover those operating costs, or is that going to be something we're going to see as the council, because your the revenues you're forecasting are lower? So, just uh, it's a timing question. So, Lynn's was a timing question too. On when are we going to see? higher operating costs that we couldn't have anticipated. And this is one you mentioned quickly. We haven't gotten to the enterprise funds, but you mentioned it when we were talking about what's going on and it sounded like you're anticipating an increase in that fee. You want me to take that, Gilford? Sure. Um, so we're, like Sonia said, we're gonna be doing quarterly reports. If it doesn't look like the uh, enterprise budget that's there now can cover the increase in the fee. So that you gotta separate revenues and expenses. So everything still has to come in underneath the expense budget. Um, if that expense budget cannot accommodate that, we would have to come back and ask for some sort of supplemental appropriation uh, to cover that. Um, go ahead, Sonia. Can I say something else? <clears throat> We're already seeing the effects of prices going up. I don't know if you remember in the third quarter when I um, mentioned that a lot of operating budgets are really starting to see the inflation. So they're very close. So we're gonna see some operating budgets that have um, already gone over, but there are savings in, from vacancies in, pay, in the pay, salary lines that kind of offset that. So we're already feeling those effects. Cause I know Kathy, you said when we feel those effects, we already are. Yeah, you, you, told, you pointed that out when we did the quarterly review mm -hmm. uh, a couple of meetings ago. Kathy, Pam has her hand. Pam, yeah, I was going to call him Pam. Pam. I thank you. Um, I had a 
I'm glad the fee the fee conversation came back up again. Um, I was going to ask if there is um, if you would kindly consider a fee structure for use of the transfer station that um, you know has sort of single family homes versus three and four unit apartments versus apartment complexes and um, and I'll just call them trash haulers, folks that that. Uh, go around as as handy persons, you know, doing trash and so forth. Um, it seemed that the single family homes are actually, you know, paying uh, a much larger percentage of of fee than the multiple users. And I just wonder if you could describe um, the current structure and uh, consider uh, a higher fee for the higher volumes. Thanks. So if you're a resident, um, whether it's a duplex or a single family, you usually get a sticker for the resident price, which is $100. That's the access sticker is $100 to access it. Um, to if you're a commercial entity and identify yourself as a commercial entity, you get a it's a 120 it's $120 $125 I believe for the sticker fee. Um, so yes, that's the way we're set up now, and then. The, there is no difference in fee on what you bring in. So it's the same price for a bag of trash for re single family residents as it is a commercial person. It's the same price if um, you're we're weighing or we're guess guesstimating your weight, it's the same price. Kathy, Andy has a sample. Yeah. Yeah, as, as a follow-up, is there an opportunity to increase the, the commercial um, fee? There, we we're going to look at all of them across the board, increasing them. Um, the problem is, is um, well, we, we get actually, if we increase the commercial entrance fee and more too much, they'll just stop using us, which I guess is okay. Um, but we may price ourselves out of their market. They do pay more in disposal costs because they bring more stuff in. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of an offset of, of what you're doing there. Gilford, what type of entities do you see in the commercial? Because that doesn't cover like the large apartment complexes, right? No, if the large, uh, most of the large apartment complexes buy a commercial sticker they and they buy it commercial. so they can bring like mattresses and TVs and those type of things in, the things that, they're, um, that their hauler won't pick up from their dumpsters. Um, they bring tires in and stuff like that. So that's what they use their sticker for. They don't use it for bringing in the, the residential trash. Um, you have medium sized apartments and like rental properties, they may buy a sticker and bring everything in. And then, um, you have some apartment groups like, um, the co-housing in North Amherst, they have a residential sticker and everyone uses, uses that one residential sticker, but they're very, they're very well versed in how they bring their trash in. They bring a very small amount for the number of people they are living there and they recycle very well. So. Paul, yeah. and, then, yeah. and then you said Andy had his hand up also. Uh, just to yeah. add on this. So to be clear, there is, there is the annual fee that just gets you the sticker that lets you walk, drive through the gate. And then when you get there, you have to pay for the stuff you drop off. So the more stuff you drop off, the more you pay for it. And there's there specific charges for tires and TVs and stuff like that. So yeah. you do, it is priced by, by, there's a fixed price and then there's a volume price. And, and did, did Andy have his hand up um, or did you just bring him in, Athena? I, he I can't. He has his hand up. Okay, Andy. Andy, Andy, you're unmuted. You can go ahead. Andy? Kathy, while we're waiting for Andy, can I ask another question that he submitted? Sure. Um, and this sort of was covered a little bit already, but um, Guilford, has the price of oil affected the price of paving materials? Are, are you able, are you seeing the bids doing, getting less for the money that's being allocated um, for roads? Uh, the, the bids are increasing. The price of paving is increasing. 
Um, this is the first year we've bid um, where our estimate was actually not like was not higher than the low bidder. We actually were pretty much had the same estimate the low bidder had. Um, that's usually doesn't happen. We're usually we're usually quite a bit higher because we use um, higher numbers just to be sure. So the prices have increased in mostly it's fuel fuel cost um, is what the price increase is. Just moving the asphalt from the plant and having the equipment moved around and, and powering the equipment that's really the biggest price increase. So I, um, Andy's hand is still up, but it looks like he's muted, Athena. So I think I'm going to go to Anna. But Andy, if you can unmute, we will. Um, I'm trying to figure out what's going on with Andy. So Anna, you may also yeah. want to bring Alicia into the room. I've tried to promote her a couple times. Um, okay, got it. I will. I will happily pause if either Andy or Alicia chimes in. Um, Here she comes. So, what magic? So. Okay, I, I hear you with the fuel cost, Guilford, and I think what's kind of coming to my mind is, gosh, wouldn't it be great if those were electric? Um, and I, I know that I am a broken record on this, but I, I think what I'm curious about is, you know, fuel's not going to get a lot cheaper anytime soon. And so what I'm wondering is if you've worked with the sustainability coordinator on creating an actual plan here for, for switching over, because I mean, I looked at the, I was on JCPC, we see the five-year vehicle buying plan, um, but I, I guess... I'd really love to see some of that strategic planning and some of that, okay, if it doesn't work exactly the way we use our, our fossil fuel vehicles now, what would we need to do to shift over, right? It's, it's not a guarantee that we can function in the exact same way when we make such a major change. And so I think something that I'd, I'd really like to see and, and I need to see is that we that that five-year plan starts to look a little different as we switch those major vehicles over um, as possible. And and that you're, you know, um, pulling from our town resources for support in that, right? I, I don't think that it needs to be all on you and Amy to to create this plan, but um, I think that's something that I I'd really like to see as we as we know that these costs aren't going down. I know that they're much more expensive up front, but those those longer term costs over time, um, I yeah, I think it's something that I'd really I'd like to see coming from DPW in future years. You know, just just to be clear, the, the costs we're seeing, this is the contractor's cost. So the contractors who are bidding our paving projects are having increases in their fuel costs. And we're seeing that passed on to us in the bids for repaving roads. I, um, I understand. Sorry, I, I do understand what that prompted for me is just kind of general fuel costs, right, in terms of running running the vehicles that we do currently have. Yeah. And then you gave you gave me a great opportunity to put my plug in. And that is. The contractor who's doing the contract work, he's paying fuel tax to maintain the road while the electrical driver is not paying any fuel tax to maintain the road. It, it's odd that you said you put your plug in. Uh. <laughs> so so uh, I think Andy's hand is still up and Sean's hand is up. So Andy. Um, I don't know. Can you, can you hear me or not? Yes. Yes. Okay, uh, the question uh, goes back to something that Sean had raised a little bit, it, but uh, the, that was when I asked about whether the increase in fuel costs was affecting paving material, and the answer seemed to be a, a partial yes, but then the other thing comes out of that is, um, is there any indication that all of these cost increases are affecting the a price that we're going to get from contract bids for paving and how is that going to affect our achieving the goals for paving with the uh, in the capital improvement program so um it, it's going to reduce what we can pave is what's going to happen um, the prices usually usually our price, like I said, our estimate is much higher than what we get for bids. This year it wasn't. So we, not, that fluff we had put in the project, we were going to try to pave one more road this year, um, and we probably will not pave that additional road. So one road out of that group was bid as an option, and that option probably won't happen this year. Sean. 
Yeah, I mean, I think this conversation and a lot of the questions today, um, they align with one of the themes that we tried to put into this budget is that as we go forward, we really have to prioritize the operating budgets and think about the operating budgets. And within that, I include capital. Um, there's a lot of new initiatives and new projects that are being proposed and uh, we have four building projects, obviously. Um, but I think this department, when you look at DPW and hear from Guilford and, and other departments, we're really hearing that we need to prioritize operating budgets because inflation has taken away what they can do. Um, there's always more being added on to what we want them to do and everything costs money. So I just, I wanna remind people that is a theme of the budget this year that as we look forward, keeping that in mind when when new initiatives or new projects are put out there that um, that we have some work to do here to get us back to, like Gilford said, 2005 um, in terms of what we can do. Thank you. Um, I think, um, Lynn, I think I don't see any more hands. Andy's hand is still up, but I think it's just he didn't take it down yet. So I have one more question in the operating, general operating or the operating for DPW before I move on to enterprise funds. Uh, this one's around tree and grounds and it's carryover from other years. Thank you, Bob Hegner. And that is, do, do we want to remain as a town in the cemetery business? And do we even have a choice? So I'll, I'll break that into two questions. Mm -hmm. Question one is, is do we want to continue to maintain the cemeteries, which I assume they're town property and we're going to want to maintain them. So that part we're going to probably want to say yes to. The second one is, is do we want to continuing off offering new burial spaces to the residents of Amherst? And the answer to that question is, is if we do, we is if we want, want to do that, we need to buy more land and find another place to expand the cemetery. We have probably about 10 to 12 lots that are not sold at this time. Um, so we, we have very low inventory of unsold lots. We do have we do have lots that are sold that are empty, are usable. So I imagine we would stay in the cemetery business, but will we continue to sell in new future lots is really a good question to think about. Okay. And there's a follow-on question to that I happen to come across this piece of information when I was looking at the elementary school lots uh, that are under consideration for the new school. And that is there's a piece of the Wildwood Cemetery that actually is on the other side of the road. And it, is there any intention to ever use that? So Wildwood, Wildwood is a private cemetery. We do not maintain Wildwood. Okay, thank you. That right there is the answer to my question. Um, any other questions on this? Yeah. And, uh, Bob has his hand up. Yeah. yeah uh, since we're on tree and ground maintenance, I, I noticed that um, you, you mentioned the issues with um, ash trees and maple trees from the emerald ash borer. I'm wondering if we're part of the Massachusetts uh, State Department of Agriculture Control Program, or are we doing it on our own? No, Mr. Snow, he works with the state program and he does coordinate with them a lot. They're really, mostly what they're doing is just monitoring. There hasn't been much treatment coming out of them so far is my understanding. Okay, thanks. Lynn, I have one and I'm, Guilford, I'm just not sure if I'm switching over to enterprise. Drainage and catch basins. So when water runs off a farm, into a ditch and then there's a catch basin. Is that you maintaining pipes? Um, is that? And that's part of our stormwater system. So that's part of your storm. So if, if there are concerns that it's clogged and not getting water, that's farmers contacting you? Um, I mean, me, me, meaning you, the DPW? It is. Um, but most of the time, what it comes out to be the problem is, is that there's a drainage way which never had an easement placed on it, and it was never given to the town to maintain. So then it never fell into our system to maintain. And um, so we maintain the cross culvert on the road because it's in the public way, but we may, may not maintain the ditch up into the farmer's fields or from the road back to the stream. 
And so changing that would be someone would have to go after an easement to to get to allow you to go in and do that work. Is that correct? We would we would need a right of entry or an easement to be on the property. Okay. Um, the other issue is because we haven't maintained it, it isn't it isn't in a maintenance program. There would be a lot of permitting that goes with it, um, which eventually, as part of the stormwater program, our MS4 program, we would actually be bringing in ditches and these things into the program and then making a plan that's in cooperation and in coordination with the conservation department that these are the ones we maintain and this is how we maintain it and this is what's allowed. So that's something that will come into the stormwater program at some time. Okay, thank you. So I'm gonna move on to the uh, enterprise funds and I actually am gonna skip over my question on the water fund because we've had a lot of discussion recently about Centennial and I know we're waiting for uh, the state to make a decision about uh, ARPA money that would possibly give us big boost in that area. Lynn, can um, I just speak to that question though? I just wanna yeah. say one thing for the record. Um, so the question was updates on Centennial project costs. I think I said this last time, but I just wanna say it again. Um, we will be coming back to the council in the near future to request um, additional funding for Centennial. Um, mm -hmm. We need to have the, the funding in place for the whole project uh, by June 30th, right? Gopher is the, the date. And this is so that we can enter right. the um, drinking water state revolving fund program, which will give us a low interest rate and possibly some loan forgiveness. And so we need to have the full funding in place. Um, and so right now that looks to be in the $18 million range for the full project. And so we'll be coming back. Um, uh, you'll be getting an update soon in the form of a, a memo and a proposed timeline. Uh, and I've scheduled, yeah, as president, I've scheduled that for the 6th okay. of June. And um, if we need um, hearing our forum because of that, I need to understand that as well. The timing, yeah. And, and one piece of that, just when we think about advocacy. So there's the drinking water state revolving fund program. There was also the forward bill that the governor put, for, mm -hmm. put forward. Um, and I got an update yesterday at a conference that it got put forward. There's some legislators who wanna sit on that and wait till the next, um, the next legislative session and governor come in. Um, and so, you know, that poses some challenges for us because we saw that it'd be, like, it'd be great if we had access to those funds this fall. Um, that may not be the case, um, but I think we do want to continue to advocate with our legislators that that's really important to us, to, regardless of whether when we get it, um, that would really help get that project back in line with our sort of original estimates for the cost of this project. Um, yeah. And I know that at least three um, letters have been sent uh, to our legislators uh, from one from Paul, one from DPW, and one from me on behalf of the council Excellent. for that issue. Um, uh, so I'm going to move on to solid waste. Uh, you may get a little of my own personal bias in this one. Um, are we planning to resume, take it, or leave it? It's a, it is a recycling function, and many people would like to see it return. And although we understand that some staff are not particularly in favor of it. Is there a way to make it return? So the easiest way to answer that question is, is that take it or leave it will not return in the form it was in before. If we want take it or leave it to return, we need to reimagine take it or leave it and come up with a methodology and a, and a way of making it work so that there's not a pile of debris left behind that then the town has to pay to dispose of because it truly wasn't a take it or leave it item. It was just truly trashed that someone sat in the take it or leave it pile because they didn't want to pay for it. So we, we need to, I mean, I'm, I'm all for trying to re-envision this. I do believe that there's a lot of neat things that people have picked up. I still have my cross country skis, which I got when I first moved here from the take it or leave it, which were like the best things I, I think I found there. I had to buy new shoes, but the skis were great. Um, but we need to re-envision how it's going to work so that there's not a liability to the, the enterprise system to have to pay for a large amount of stuff that is not reusable and it's just becomes trash at the take it or leave it. Is this something that many, several of our uh, environmentally focused 
uh, groups in Amherst might be able to organize uh, volunteerism around? I, I think it. I think it is. I mean, we need to start thinking more like what you know some of the things like Northampton's doing. With they have a program for toy swaps, and they have a toy uh, program for doing the exact same thing. It actually doesn't reside at the transfer station. It resides somewhere else. Um, yeah. But they have places to collect things, and then they can go through it and make things happen. Um, that's really something. Yeah, that's how, really not how it needs to kind of come about to, to be right. sustainable. Yeah. By the way, other places that have donations like Survival Center and uh, uh, Salvation Army, et cetera, they have the same problem. People just leave stuff because they don't want to pay the dump fee. Paul, you had your hand up. Yeah, I just want to mention that the Salvation Army Goodwill, there are lots of places for people to do this exact same thing if they want to. So it's not like the take it or leave it is the only option available. Um, so. Okay. You know, but just on that theme, you know, Lynn, I like the idea of some people could weigh in and come up with a system because Salvation Army has a gatekeeper yeah. um, who, uh, particularly under COVID, they made me open up my box and they said, we're not going to take what you have in that box okay. Um, okay. because it, it so, so I agree, you know, uh, uh, some, if we reopen it, Lynn, I think we need a thoughtful way of figuring out how it doesn't become a dump it rather than um, just leave it. Yeah. Right. Uh, my second question is also personally motivated. Unfortunately, my son loves Dunkin' Donuts, but you won't take their, pla their plastic cups, even though they have the recycling mark on them in the recycling program is why so it's so it is a plastic um plastics have those recycling marks actually tell you what type of plastic it is um and only about three types of plastic have a recycling market and there's like seven seven different types of plastics out there that you can see on the i think i've seen one through seven on the marks if you're not in one of those three categories they recycle um, you basically are just adding trash to the recycling stream, which then the person we transfer the bottles and cans to has to screen out and take and, and pay to, to get rid of in trash. So it's um, recycling is changing a lot. Um, the paper market is very strong again, it's doing well. Um, containers, if you have metal containers, if you have glass containers, metals are doing really well, glass is doing okay. Um, we could use a nice glass recycler in the area, um, but plastic containers, there's so many people trying to pass their plastic container off as being able to be recycled, but people don't wanna recycle them. So it's just clogging up the recycling stream with those, those containers. And Dunkin' Donuts cups are one of them. It would be better if Dunkin' Donuts went to a paper cup that can be composted. And... Got it. It's uh, for the, uh, the other question uh, that I had here is basically related to the solar array, but it's on the landfill. So it's, I, it's not clear what it is. There at some point, when that solar array is fully connected, it will generate electricity. Is the town going to use that electricity? Are we going to sell that electricity? How will the proceeds of that electricity either be attributed to town departments or if sold off, where will that money go? You want me to take that one, Cuffer? Yeah, it's your um, Sean. So, so that's a really good project for the town. Um, so in terms, there's, there's a few different revenue streams. So there's a payment that we will get each year for $78,000. Um, that payment is broken down into three different types of categories. Uh, one is property tax for the land that's being used. Um, that will flow through to the town like other taxes. Um, so that won't benefit the solid waste fund directly. Um, there is a, uh, a pilot payment for the system itself um, and that one, I still have to talk with the assessor about whether that can go to the solid waste funder that also has to be treated like, um, other taxes. I think it has to be treated like other taxes and would also come to the town, um, to the, to the general fund. And then the third one is a, uh, 
basically a rent fee or um, it's whatever the difference is between the 78,000 and what the taxes are calculated at. Um, and that, that amount will go into the solid waste fund. We think it's at least $20,000. Um, it'll slowly change over time as the taxes go up. Um, they'll eat up a bigger piece of that 78,000. So the rent piece will shrink a little bit. Um, but there will be a, a decent sized chunk of funds that will be going into the solid waste fund each year. And then there's the, the other benefit is the um, electricity. So the electricity is going to go to the town. Um, it's going to come to us in the form of uh, credits on our bills. And so we have to assign those credits to different accounts. Um, it's about 3.9 or three somewhere uh, in that area megawatts. So it's a big chunk of our electricity. It's you know around half, maybe a little bit more than half. Um, and we have to assign those to individual accounts. And then when we do that, whatever budget line item pays for that electricity, they're going to see their costs go way down. And so we, you know, Sonia and I have to think about how it's, it's going to cause some realignment and how the electricity budgets are split in town. Um, because whatever ones we pick, they're going to see all this budget relief and we don't, you know, we need to think how we spread that out fairly. Um, so, so it's going to require a little bit of rethinking of the electricity budgets throughout the, throughout the system. Um, but we'll see some significant savings there as well. And do you see that happening in time for the FY24 budget? I think for in, in time for the FY24 budget, yes. Okay. Can, and when, can, do you in, um, when do you anticipate that the uh, array will actually go live? That I don't know. I know they're moving along well. Guilford, I don't know if you've seen any uh, newer updates. It seems like they're getting pretty close to um, at least testing the system if they haven't already. Yeah, so we're, we're hoping to do a ribbon cutting event probably in June, Lynn. Okay. So okay. We're thinking about the, that time frame. Okay. Can I just ask, this is a terrific question, Lynn, but um, for the where you put the credit, one, one question that was raised with Centennial is whether we, since it's a big electricity user, once the plant gets up and open, whether we could do a solar array to offset that. So my question is, you start to think this through, Sean, um, that would affect water rates that are being affected by Centennial. Um, so, so would would the allocation have to go to general fund or could it go to enterprise funds that weren't um, there weren't solid waste? Um, it, it could go to whatever, I believe it can go to whatever accounts we select. So, uh, you know, one difference on the town side from the schools, on the school side, we had like five electricity accounts and it was really easy and simple. On the town side, I don't know, it was 40, 50 different, <laughs> different electricity accounts, uh, maybe more than that. And so, you know, some of it is about administrative uh, ease by picking some of our bigger users for the electricity and applying it to those accounts. Um, of which a lot of the enterprise fund accounts are those. So the, the uh, wastewater um, account and the, the water treatment accounts, those are some of our bigger bigger users. So I could see it being applied to those. That being said, I, I still think we need to give more thought to how the savings are shared throughout the entire yeah. system. Yeah. No, I, I was thinking that too. It, it, I'm just glad to hear that thinking is going on. And then as you know, with, in capital, we just, there's a five-year plan that a lot of Crocker would be moving off of, of fossil fuel. And, right. and so it might be some of the buildings that we are upgrading in terms of being more climate action, uh, help get the asset because they're moving to more, more electric use. If they're gonna see something on the electric, you know, just so trying to think of a rationale for the allocation as well. Right. Yeah, thanks. Um, I, I also want to be aware, Michelle, you said you needed to leave by 1120, I think. And I I've, do, or about 1125. I didn't know if you wanted to have certain questions before we move on to others. You know, I unfortunately missed a portion of the conversation. So I, I may had, have had a question that already got asked. So I'll just, I'll follow up maybe after. Thank you okay. though for checking in. Yeah. Okay. Um, should I go on, Kathy? Yep. I don't see any hands, Lynn. Okay. So the transportation fund, um, at least we during COVID, it seemed to take the biggest hit and is also seeming to be slow in recovery. Um, what uh, do you project regarding the future of the fund? And should we be considering 
adjustments to it somehow with fees or whatever? Yeah, I can speak to that a little bit. Um, so the the permit um, system changes that were adopted mm -hmm. by the council, that'll help that mm -hmm. program long-term. Um, right. I think we'll get a really good sense how far it's come back from the pandemic with the fourth quarter financial report, um, seeing how much it's been used uh, May through June or April through June. It seems like downtown has been pretty active and pretty busy. Um, so seeing if, how that compares to the fourth quarter of let's say 20 FY19 um, will be interesting uh, and we'll get a good sense of you know what percentage we are uh, getting back. Um, so I don't think we have to make any adjustments right now. We have tried to um, we we have tried to manage expenses in that fund. So we have one uh, parking enforcement, a part-time position that we haven't filled yet. We've left that vacant um, to try to keep expenses down. We will probably look to fill that in the near future if we see again as parking comes back and we want to make sure uh, all hours are being covered when enforcement needs to be done. Um, we are looking at some infrastructure changes. We know we've talked about more signage. We've talked about um, we, we have to make some decisions in the near future about meters uh, because we have to decide if we're going to stick with the standalone meters or move toward, towards kiosks. I think our interest is probably moving towards kiosks. It's a little cleaner. Um, you know, they can manage multiple spaces um, and, the, and the information you can pull from them is better in terms of usage and, um, uh, and you can make just to make changes easier. Um, and I think the other thing we're, you know, we see coming up, there's been some changes to parking that we'll have to monitor. There's the North Common project and see how that impacts parking in the future. Um, there are some new developments coming in downtown that will, I think, increase demand for parking. So, so I think it's on the right track and it's getting back to where it needs to be. There's gonna be a lot of things that will be increasing the demand for parking downtown, um, which will be good for the fund. I know there's, there's other options that council has to consider around the supply of parking, um, but I think the demand is gonna get back to where it was pretty quickly. Thanks. Guilford, Guilford has his hand up too. Guilford, go ahead. So one of the other things that, that is gonna impact the transportation fund is what do we wanna do with our downtown? Um, we've been doing the back end angle parking to try as an experiment. Uh, we've fit some spaces in. Um, some people use it quite well. Other people don't use it quite well. Do we want to have more parklets? Do we want to take out spaces with parklets? Um, we, we need to, and we've been talking about this on a holistic type view, is what do we want to start making changes to the downtown? And then those changes may affect what we have for parking spaces on the main roads. So that's something we've been talking about and we need to continue to kind of focus on is what do we want? Do we want to make changes downtown? Do we want to start making a bigger sidewalks and have more dining and then moving the parking off the streets? Those are things that really need to happen. I mean, we haven't finished painting the downtown for this season because we're not sure what's how, how, what we want to do. Um, that's just something that's in there to think about too. Go for just as so a where do we stand on the council's vote regarding the back end parking? I think it was the earliest one we did, which is you know down in front of Antonio's. Are are, are we still good or do we need to renew that vote? I think they've expired. And then I think we better get it on a council agenda. Um but, thank you. But the thought is. Do you, do you want to keep that type of stuff? Do you want to explore more? And then does that, how does that give you more spaces or less parking spaces? And that defect directly affects what happens to this, the fund. And, you also, know, I, I, I'm yeah. trying to raise my hand. Yeah, go ahead, Paul. Uh, just a note, uh, we are hearing from businesses about people who want to continue to have outdoor dining again with the extension of the law. So that is still that information is still being gathered. We know of two businesses now who have asked for that, that we are looking at. Um, so that this is still playing out. So I've got, uh, an, um, I think, three items on the June 6th draft agenda that deal with public way. Is there any possibility that we should vote on extending at least what we have on June 6th? It's a question, Paul, to you and yeah, to- Yeah, so I'll look at that. I'll look at what the existing, what the original vote was. Okay, thanks. And um, I just, 
Can, Lynn, I just want to jump in on the back in parking where Guilford said we've had some experience now with it and some people can or can't manage it. As part of the North Commons lot removal, um, um, I was one of the ones who questioned where we were going to do the back end parking on Main Street across from the bookstore. So I just like to feed the experience that we've had with it because one of the ideas, let's try it out on whether we think that's a good idea before we replicate that just because we said we would do it. Um, and it was to give us five spaces, but it's right by the bus stop. And it's right by the turn where the buses come in to that street. So it's it's less protected than the back end places are that we currently have. Um, so I just, I just wanna get whatever experience we have to have people say, wouldn't do it, okay, iffy, whatever. Um, well, and if we want a larger discussion, we probably have to look at either the 13th or the last or the optional last meeting in June. But uh, let's just keep it in mind. And I wasn't necessarily saying putting it on the same list. I was just saying that North Commons is coming in along the pike. So got it. let's not forget it's got back in parking, too. Yeah. So that's the end of my questions on enterprise funds. Bob has his hand up. Yeah, yeah I Bob. have one question on the transportation fund. I noticed on page 243 that we're paying $30,000 to the business improvement district and it's coming out of the transportation fund. And, and I question A, why we're paying that in the first place and B, why it's coming out of the transportation fund. <clears throat> and I guess the other third part is if we do work for the bid, do we get reimbursed for it? Are they are we billing them for it? So a number of things. So when the bid was set up, uh, there were three partners. Uh, there were there were four partners: the business owners, uh, and then there was the Amherst College, Univass, and um, the town. And we all agreed to contribute a fixed amount. And you know, when the town said, "Where was that fixed amount coming from?" We said the transportation improvement fund, which is funded by parking revenues, all from downtown, seemed to be the logical source for that funds because this, the business improvement district, is a, a basically a parking benefit district that supports the local businesses, and there was a logic to drawing from that. Um, I think you know there are a lot of things the town does to help local businesses. DPW uh, spends a lot of time, and and they're an important constituent in terms of listening to what the concerns are about the downtown infrastructure, but I mean, Guilford's team is, you know, they thank Guilford's team a lot because Guilford's team puts out a lot of information, a lot of stuff for Mary Maple and things that benefit the entire town, but it's initiated by the bid. So I think we sort of work more as much in partnership with them and they contribute, you know, they pay for the $20,000 a year to put lights on the Mary Maple. Uh, we help them in different ways by hanging banners or doing things like that. Um, so, um, and I think, you know, if the bid did not exist, we as a town would want to do some of these things just to make our town look good. Like, I think, I'm not sure about that. They maintain the flower baskets that are downtown. Um, uh, we don't do anything with that, but I think, Guilford, you can correct me, but when they hire the, you know, hang the spring is here banners or graduation season, we hang those because we we've those. got the equipment for, to do it. Okay, thanks. That's fair enough. Yeah. Um, I just want to, check Kathy yeah you do you still have a quorum and yep I think we still do too uh no we don't uh so I'm going to adjourn the council meeting but that does not mean that the counselors that are in this meeting can't continue to ask questions they actually can so the council meeting is adjourned at 11 17. uh Paul, I had one last piece and it's, I really wanna just, um, several people have asked about where we are on the DPW facility and let me just direct it to you versus to um, Guilford and um, there you go. Yeah, so our mission continues to be, you know, to build four new buildings, which is the elementary school, the library, a DPW facility, and a fire station. We know that the fire station, the best location for the fire station is the DPW facility. We have um, looked at many sites. We had one site that was donated by Amherst College that was deemed not a, not uh, to have too much neighborhood opposition on, on Stanley Street and Southeast Street. Um, 
since then we have struggled to locate a site that, you know, we need a number of acres in the town of Amherst that's unencumbered and that meets zoning requirements and uh, is flat and can accommodate a, you know, multiple eight acres, you know, probably site. They're not easy to come by. Um, you know, we did an RFP. We had several responses, some from other communities who said, we've got land in Hadley that you could use. And we've looked at those pretty actively. Um, so our mission right now is to find a location, identify a location. There's, a, we feel, we're feeling a lot of urgency on this um, because we got to get a site because we got to get these other projects moving um, and keep looking at um, options available. It's, it, there's additional pressure now because of the increased cost on um, capital. And, um, you know, we're, our, our mission hasn't changed, but we will be reviewing, you know, Sean's going to, is updating the model. So we, the council, once we get through our budget season, he's going to have more time to focus on that. There's a, it's a pretty complicated uh, assessment of things. So I think once we get through that, uh, you'll have a better sense of where we can, where we're going to be financially, if we have a location or not. And if the council still wants to move forward with them, you know, we're, our mission hasn't changed. We're, we're continuing to move forward on all four projects. Okay. Uh, and let me just mention that Paul did mention that after budget season is um, winding down, uh, we have asked Sean to do an update on the model and uh, the large capital projects actually, in addition to coming under the purview of the council also comes under the purview of the finance committee. Uh, so that when we did the model the last time, it was really, we did the dry runs with the finance committee. Uh, and we haven't decided how to do that in this time, but um, clearly the finance committee would be involved in that discussion. So Kathy, that includes my, <laughs> I thought it was a short set of questions, but obviously not. No, thank you, Lynn. Um, and thank you very much, Amy and Guilford. So I don't know whether there are any other questions. And if they're not, one of my requests would be, I think this was an excellent set of questions. So when we write up this section, I, we might want to append them. Um, and I'm seeing Bob just raise his hand. So um, first, I'm going to ask for any final remarks before we, uh, or questions. Thanks, Bob. Yeah, I just had a question about the temporary bridge on Station Road. Kind of what's going on with that? Because I know that last time we we met with you, you said that we had to replace it. The state was going to require us to replace it. I just wanted to kind of know what the plans are right now. So we're 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 still going through the permitting process for the new bridge with Mass DOT at this time, Department of Transportation. Um, so that's where we are. Um, the the price is still significant. We do have a, a small grant that would pay for half a million of it, but I, the price is more than a million. So we're just working it right now. It's, um, we do have to replace it. Mass DOT wants us to replace it. And our consultant who actually signed off on us doing it the way we did it, they, they're a little leery of us keeping it longer. We're just, we're moving it along slowly. Okay, thank you. Any other questions of Guilford and and Amy while we while they're with us? I'm not seeing any hands. Um, then I think we will thank you very much. And you know, Lynn's opening remark were, and we just saw it today. The scope of what you work on is amazing, um, and uh, the the level of which. Uh, engagement when you're coming back to us. And for those of you who weren't around for last finance time when we did this, one of the things that was impressed on us is how much your teams work with each other because Bob asked a lot of questions on how do you figure out the salaries because some people are working sometimes in an enterprise fund and something on. So the, there's clearly a management to all of this in addition to the permitting and working with the agencies. So, so we, we thank you um, uh, for both being responsive and working on behalf of the, all of us in town. So thank you. I, Kathy, I also wanna just say and highly recommend that if you have not viewed the presentation about sidewalks and roads and how we do that assessment and the prioritization on it that was given to TSO, please go view it. 
it actually finally answers a question and takes a lot of the mystery out of how these decisions are made and um, the data that goes in to making the decisions about sidewalk and road repair. We, we can reflect that also in the report, Lynn, you know, just as a cross reference. Yeah. So, um, so I think we're through with this section um, and the next, I do wanna open it up for public comments, but I wanna make sure for uh, people in case anyone else is, uh, did Mich Michelle is still with us, um, that the next agenda item next Tuesday is general government. Um, and Sean will be posting or uh, Sean and Athena will be posting that. And we postponed three of what, what we were gonna do on Tuesday. So we will be meeting that, ex at least tentatively, we will be meeting that extra time slot that was to, if needed. And then the last comment, and I think Andy, let me see if Andy is still here. So I'm just He's gonna not. say- he okay, I'm just going to. Okay, so what the process we've used for all of you who have a section is that people have sent Andy a draft paragraph of of their section that will become part of our report, and he will is going planning on sending last year's to everyone so you can see a model. So I just want to make sure we do that. And then I think we can, um, I think both Amy, Amy and Guilford, you can both leave. I think it was fantastic, uh, your time spending with us. Thank you very much. Um, and, and I wanted to open up, let me, we do still have public. Uh, so I wanna see if anyone in the, our public has a question and we're open for public comments right now. If you have any, please raise your hand. I'm not seeing any. And um, since I am the temporary chair, I have no items that I did not anticipate in the last 48 hours. So therefore there are none. And I think that means we're adjourned and we will see all of you, all of us next Tuesday when we do general government. Thank you very much.